Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming in the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Wars and rumors of wars as both Russia and North Korea threaten to use nuclear weapons. Experts worry Vladimir Putin could unleash atomic weapons in Ukraine. That threat coming as Russia struck back at Ukraine for the attack on its bridge to Crimea. And a second nuclear warning from another country, North Korea, as it confirms its recent barrage of missiles launches were designed to simulate the use of its tactical battlefield nukes. Dale Hurt has our report. North Korea says seven missile launches, including two Sunday, were drills of its tactical nuclear operation units training to wipe out U.S. and South Korean targets. Pyongyang is upset over recent U.S.-South Korean live-fire exercises in the region. Meanwhile, explosions rocked multiple Ukrainian cities today, including the capital of Kyiv, killing at least eight people and injuring 24. The attack was Russian President Vladimir Putin's response to the Saturday explosion on the huge bridge connecting Russia to its annexed territory of Crimea, the attack believed to be the work of Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky told his nation Russia is trying to wipe us off the face of the earth. This is there are growing fears Putin might use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Joe Biden recently warned that the risk of nuclear Armageddon is the highest it's been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called those comments reckless. Those comments were reckless. And I think they, even more importantly, they demonstrate maybe one of the greatest foreign policy failures of the last decades, which was the failure to deter Vladimir Putin in the same way that the Trump administration did for four years. The White House defended Biden's statement. The president was reflecting the very high stakes that uh, they're in, in play right now. His comments were not based on uh, new or fresh intelligence or new indications uh, that uh, Mr. Putin has made a decision uh, to use nuclear weapons. Former Joint Chiefs Chair Mike Mullen says Putin's nuclear threats have to be taken seriously. He's a cornered, I believe, a cornered animal, and I think he's more and more dangerous just what's happened in the last 24 hours. Tonight, rescuers pulling survivors out the rubble. <laughs> After a barrage of Russian missiles rained down on civilian targets in Zaporizhia in southeastern Ukraine. At least 14 people killed, dozens more injured. And for the first time tonight, Vladimir Putin calling Saturday's massive bridge explosion in Crimea a terrorist act carried out by Ukraine. This video circulating online showing the moment Russia says a truck bomb exploded, setting fire to seven train cars carrying fuel. The bridge engulfed in flames, a section of the roadway ripped apart. Before and after satellite images showing the damage, the bridge both a vital supply link for the Russian military and a key symbol of Moscow's claims to the Crimean Peninsula illegally annexed in 2014. The attack a day after Putin's 70th birthday did 
dealing him another humiliating blow as Ukrainian forces break through battle lines in the south and east. Ukrainian forces liberating more villages as they advance towards the center of Kherson. They've now managed to retake more than a thousand square miles over the last two weeks alone. Putin's repeated nuclear threats and uncertainty over what he'll do next, prompting President Biden to issue a stark warning Thursday at a private fundraiser, saying, quote, we have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. We heard that ominous warning from President Biden. Britt Klanet joins us tonight from Kiev. And Britt, now that Putin has accused Ukraine of terrorism, what are those in his inner circle demanding? Yeah, Lindsay, Putin was already facing criticism from nationalists for his recent battlefield losses here in Ukraine. But this bridge attack, it's triggered a chorus of anger from Russian hardliners whose calls are only growing louder. They want a strong retaliation for that bridge attack. One Putin ally saying terrorists must be treated unequivocally. Meanwhile, a Biden foreign policy initiative in the Middle East is putting the American economy at risk. OPEC is cutting production in part because the White House is trying to make a nuclear deal with Iran, which many Arab nations oppose. Joe Biden is continuing to tap the strategic petroleum reserve to try to keep gas prices lower in the weeks leading up to election day. This is a failure of American policy. Joe Biden is directly responsible for the place that the world finds itself in energy. And frankly, his party, the progressive left, uh, 25 years of thinking you were going to run the world on sunshine and windmills. America's new energy crisis even has Barack Obama's Treasury Secretary blaming the White House. Look, we made a mistake by canceling the Keystone Pipeline. We made a mistake by slowing down all kinds of permitting uh, activity. We made a mistake by being hostile as a country to uh, natural gas. Proverbs 29.2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. To Iran, where violent anti-government protests are intensifying and spreading, hackers successfully targeted the state's evening newscast, interrupting the program for several seconds with a message in solidarity with the protesters, calling for people to join and rise up. Those demonstrations are now entering their fourth week. Tonight, demonstrations spreading, Iranian women bravely going head to head with security forces. Protests erupting at universities across the country. They are calling these demonstrations the beginning of a revolution. Acts of defiance infiltrating the airwaves, hackers targeting an Iranian state TV newscast, a mask appearing on screen followed by a picture of the supreme leader, the Ayatollah, surrounded by flames, with pictures of four young women allegedly killed by police. The protest starting four weeks ago with the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini for allegedly wearing her hijab improperly. Now a fight for regime change, fearlessly putting their lives on the line. ABC News obtaining audio from one of those protesters inside Iran. We are not naming her for security reasons. People all around the world should know that women have been suffering so much through these years and enough is enough. Local media reporting the latest victims were two teenagers, Serena Esmail Zadeh, a popular vlogger on YouTube, and Nika Shakarami, both killed. For freedom. The show of solidarity now worldwide, from movie star Juliette Binoche to the women of Iran. Are free. To a politician in Sweden's parliament, women cutting their hair, now becoming a symbol of resistance. Lindsay, Iran has been gripped by many protests in the past, but what's different about these demonstrations is the sheer determination of these women and their continued defiance. Even the dead are a risk. Every departure, a potential new case. As Ebola continues to spread through Uganda, the epidemic appears to have started around the beginning of September when people started dying in a small village in a sub county of Kodi Madudu. The outbreak only declared much later on September 20th after a diagnosis in the central Uganda district of Mubende. 
Two weeks later, it spread significantly. Yet experts fear there may be dozens of underreported cases. Uganda is no stranger to Ebola. The last outbreak hit the country in 2019 and only ended a year later as the world was waking up to COVID-19. Uganda has decided against closing public spaces, but it says the same infrastructure and practices used to curb the spread of COVID-19 will be used to keep Ebola in check. And while the variant responsible for this particular outbreak, the Sudan virus, does not currently have a vaccine, trials could start in four to six weeks. Among the vaccine candidates to be trialed is a jab developed by Oxford University using the same technology employed in the COVID-19 vaccine it developed with AstraZeneca. Fresh hope against a deadly disease that has ravaged African nations for decades. Various outbreaks of pandemic diseases such as Ebola or the coronavirus have prompted many to ask why God allows or even causes pandemic diseases and whether such illnesses are a sign of the end times. God brought plagues and diseases on his people and on his enemies to make them see his power, as we read in Exodus 9.14 and verse 16. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart, and on your servants, and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. But indeed, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. God destroyed many people for various acts of disobedience, as we read in Numbers 16.46 and verse 49. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. Again, in the book of Numbers, God acts on disobedience. Numbers 25, 1-3, and verse 9. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. It's sometimes hard to understand why our loving and merciful God would display such anger and wrath toward his people. But remember this, God's punishments always have the goal of repentance and restoration. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. In these verses of scripture, we see God using disaster to draw his people to himself, to bring about repentance and the desire to come to him as children to their heavenly father. The spread of viruses such as Ebola and the coronavirus are just a foretaste of pandemics that will be part of the end times. Jesus prophesied of future plagues associated with the last days, as we read in Luke 21.11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. For those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, disease should be a reminder that life on this earth is fragile and can be lost at any moment. As bad as pandemics are, hell will be far worse. The Christian, however, has the assurance of salvation and the hope of eternity because of the blood of Christ shed on the cross for us, as we read in Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Homes, schools and businesses destroyed. From the air, the extent of damage in Las Tejerias is clear. On the ground, it's a race against time to search for the missing. Many people are trapped under layers of rubble and mud. Torrential rain caused the El Pato River to burst its banks, triggering a landslide. The river overflowed and there are people we still haven't found that are trapped. We need help. My brother is missing. It's not only my pain. We're all feeling it. I haven't slept. I haven't eaten. 
I don't know if my niece is in there or the water dragged her. Luis Fuentes is standing where his shop once stood. So many families lost their homes. I've just lost my pizzeria that opened only two years ago. I'm a new entrepreneur. Now look, I have nothing. Around 1,000 emergency personnel are taking part in the rescue and search operation. Los Tejerias is 67 kilometers southwest of Venezuela's capital, Caracas. The city's been hit the hardest by this year's La Nina weather pattern that brings wetter conditions to Asia, Africa and Latin America. Last night's hurricane produced a low-pressure system that quickly caused flooding. That's 100 litres of water per square metre, which is a record for rainfall in this area in one month. As shelters are being set up, emergency crew are working to restore electricity and water supplies. President Nicolas Maduro has described the situation as difficult and painful. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. I'm in southern Spain, the time when the olives turn green and plump ahead of the harvest. The province of Jaén has become a virtual monoculture, more than 60 million olive trees producing more than a fifth of the world's olive oil. But this year's harvest is projected to be down massively. Gabriel Chica has spent his life working these groves. He says this summer's drought, which scientists have called the worst for 500 years, has left some trees barren, some with a much reduced number of usable olives. This is the main source of income, especially for people from the high-end area. Without olives, then construction work goes down, and a bit of everything else will be lost. If people don't have incomes, they don't spend. Olive trees are famously hardy, able to survive extremes of heat and cold and keep producing their fruit. The fact that these trees are so stressed after this year's drought and heat wave is a worrying sign for this region that relies so heavily on them. The fear is that climate change could greatly disrupt Spain's olive oil production line. The country provides nearly half of the entire global supply. Agriculture already places huge demands on limited water resources. Industry leaders fear this summer's shock could point towards a future not too far away. Everything indicates that what used to happen occasionally is becoming something structural. This unfortunately means average temperatures will rise with higher peaks as well and very little rain. And when it does rain, it's going to be torrential. In the fields, the work goes on. The aim to salvage as much as possible of this year's harvest. The forecast is for more dry weather in the coming weeks. And while that's a worry, the real fear is what will happen to this arid farmland in the coming years. In the book of Job, chapter 37, 5 through 13, we learn that God controls the weather. God thunders marvelously with his voice. He does great things which we cannot comprehend. For he says to the snow, fall on the earth, likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. He seals the hand of every man, that all men may know his work. The beasts go into dens and remain in their lairs. From the chamber of the south comes the whirlwind, and cold from the scattering winds of the north. By the breath of God ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture he saturates the thick clouds, he scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. Correction is the Hebrew word, Shabbat, which means, literally, a stick for punishing, writing, fighting, ruling, walking, etc. Job 37.13 can be translated like this. He causes it to come, whether for punishment, or for his land, or for mercy. God controls the weather for three reasons. For punishment, for his land, or for mercy. The extreme weather we have been witnessing is clearly punishment. As the world continues to spin out of control, we can no longer afford to ignore the truth. Almighty God, the creator of heaven, earth, and all things is trying to get our attention. He is letting us know through powerful weather catastrophes and the events happening in the world around us that he is in control. And he is preparing to intervene in world affairs climaxing in the return of Jesus Christ. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does His kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of His goodness? forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith, and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. 
For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God. Our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word.